I'm Jenna, uh, and I am presenting today on um, the experiences and strategies of cultural immersion um, amongst Moroccans in the Boston area. Um, and my advisor is Professor Mary White um, from the Anthropology Department. So this is a cultural anthropological perspective on cultural immersion. So just to give you a quick rundown of what I'll be talking about, I'm going to start with a brief introduction, tell you a little bit about why this is important to me and what methodology I used. Um, then I'll try to explain the theoretical framework that I used, um, then give you a little bit of background on Morocco very, very, very briefly, <laughs> um, and then talk about the case study that I did and some conclusions that I was able to reach. So um, I studied abroad in Morocco last year um, after studying two years of Arabic, um, and I'm an Arabic minor. So Morocco was a um, very interesting experience for me, um, and I was really able to try to immerse myself in the culture, um, which had a variety of advantages and challenges that I had to face. Um, but this really got me interested in the process of cultural immersion, um, and especially during short educational sojourns. So people that are moving to different places just for a few years to study and learn something about the culture or just another, another field. Um, so for my project, I interviewed five Moroccans um, in Boston, um, all who had this common theme of coming to Boston for education. Um, and their stories were very different, but they also had a few kind of common um, underlying themes that I was able to kind of tease out um, despite their huge variability. So just give you so. This is um, my theoretical frameworks. So this was um, presented by Frederick Barth in his book, Balinese Worlds. And the more I look at it, the more complicated it gets, but also the more um, it tends to actually explain like everything. So I'll try to just give a brief overview. So he came up with this theory um, for analyzing the meaning of acts. And basically, so if we start over here, so these are the knowledge, concepts, values, and concerns that we hold. And these are things that are affected by the way that we were raised, the place we grew up in, all of the social and cultural kind of pressures that we feel in an everyday life. And these things are affected by our experiences and our interpretations, and also affect our experiences and interpretations. So that's why there's those double arrows there. And this is also referred to as our cultural stock. And it actually goes to, um, influences our intentions for action. So everything that we do is kind of has this base in these knowledge, concepts, values, and concerns. Um, and then obviously, when you actually go from intentions to acting, there's other material factors that kind of get in the way. And then that, so that in, mixed with your intentions um, pre present like actual events or actions. Um, so, What's interesting here is that this is kind of a model for individual action, but there is a um, place here for cultural and social factors to play in. And that's right here, oh my gosh, I can't, right here in this, this cultural stock. So these things are affected by what Barth refers to as traditions of knowledge or cultural streams. So traditions of knowledge are things like your religion or science or modernity or magic or whatever things that you believe in that shape the way that you see the world and the way that you see yourself in the world. Um, and that's, that's where that plays in here. So I'll talk about more about traditions of knowledge when I'm analyzing my actual Moroccans. So just to give you a little bit of background on Morocco. Um, so Morocco is really complex and diverse. There's a lot of different ethnicities. Um, it's pretty religiously homogenous, but there's a lot of different variations of the religion within the country. And it has a really complex history and has, a, has had a lot of influence from various um, cultural groups. But I like to <laughs> present these um, pictures because I think that this is kind of the picture of, of Morocco that most people have in their heads. I mean, this is actually a camel that I rode um, <laughs> in the Sahara. Um, and people kind of think of this like exotic picture of Morocco. But more and more today, Morocco is looking more like this. So the, these are pictures of Casablanca. If you notice in this slide, in this picture, um, there's a satellite dish on almost every roof, um, more than one on some roofs. And this just shows that Moroccans today, over 90% of them have televisions in their homes. And they're connected to global streams of information and knowledge. Um, they're very modernized, very urbanized. There's been this huge movement of Moroccans into the city and just very rapid urban expansion. Um, and this has really affected the way that Moroccans view the world and the way that they understand being Moroccan. Um, 
this is obviously not just a Moroccan phenomenon. This is definitely a global kind of phenomenon. But it's really interesting in Morocco, especially because um, there, Morocco was actually colonized by France and a small part by Spain in the early, early 20th century. And they won independence um, of, after about 50 years of colonization. So these kind of cultural streams um, a little bit earlier in their history really brought in a lot of different views. Um, and then now with the internet and with television and pop stars like Justin Bieber is like the biggest Moroccan pop star. <laughs> um, it's just there's a lot of cultural mixing that goes on in Morocco before Moroccans ever leave the country. Um, so that makes it really interesting to analyze what happens when they, when they do leave. Um, OK. So for my project, I spoke to five people in the Boston area. Um, I really wish I could give you guys a piece of their stories, but I'm going to just kind of glaze over that. Um, I can tell you more about them later. They're very, very interesting people. Um, but what I kind of gained from my interviews with them is that there are, there is a lot of variation in their experiences and a lot of variation in those strategies that they employ to kind of deal with being immersed in a culture that's new or foreign or conflicting with their other, with their, their identities. Um, so these strategies range from, from more on the side of retaining more of their Moroccan identities to more assimilating into American society. Um, and there's a lot of different things that kind of go into that. Um, but even though there's so much variation, there are also some common traditions of knowledge that they share um, that kind of in impact their experience and, and give us a, a little bit of a picture of why being Moroccan in Boston is, can be kind of classified as one category. Um, they are also interesting because they were all exposed to some form of American education. So the first three here, Doha Ume Mansara, were um, actually went to an American school in Casablanca before they ever came to America. Um, so this was an, an American high school education, but in Morocco. And so they were exposed to many cultural kind of streams there. Khadija, the last one, was actually born and raised in Boston. But her parents are both Moroccan. And her educational sojourn was kind of the opposite. She went to Morocco on study abroad <laughs> with me um, and had just a really interesting cultural experience there. So, so what I did, what I identified um, through these interviews were these two really important cultural streams that were shared amongst all my informants. The first is Islam. So Islam, so Morocco is a Muslim country. Um, the king declared a few years ago that all Moroccans are Muslim, despite what they may say. Um, so it's totally a dominant kind of worldview in Morocco. Um, that being said, there are a lot of varying degrees of religiosity amongst Moroccans and amongst my, my informants. Um, so while they kind of practice or believe different things to different extents, um, they are still all, all influenced by the hegemonic kind of ideas of Islam that they learned in their childhoods. Um, this is also an interesting kind of cultural stream because it's, it can be a source of prejudice from Americans. So we all know in post 9-11 America, there's a lot of misconceptions and um, ideas that a lot of people hold about Islam that um, are not necessarily true, are maybe stereotypes, um, and are, can be largely negative. Um, and so this is kind of a, can be a source of alienation um, for Moroccans living in America, um, and all Muslims for that matter. Um, so whether or not my informants chose to identify as Muslim, which they all do, but to different extents, um, how open they are about being Muslim um, is really interesting. Um, in kind of placing them as more Moroccan or more American um, on this spectrum. So the second uh, cultural stream I looked at was education. Um, this is very interesting because the people that I spoke to were all had experience with non-Moroccan education. Um, so some of them went to, I mean, most of them went to American schools or um, were studied abroad in other places in Europe and Fran France or wherever. Um, and so they weren't totally influenced by just Moroccan cultural streams um, in their like early childhood. Um, so this kind of uh, built this value of cosmopolitanism, 
or multiculturalism in my informants. Um, so a lot of them shared this idea of wanting to meet a lot of different people from different places and associate with these people and get new knowledge and values um, to the point where actually some of them didn't want to have any American friends because they thought it was better to have international friends or they could maybe relate to them better. Um, so there's this really strong multicultural like attitude and Moroccans also kind of pride themselves in being aware of a lot of different cultures and they are kind of they see themselves as like maybe the, the passageway between Africa and um, Europe, and so that's a really important part of Moroccan identity. Um, but this is also largely dependent on class. So the people that I spoke to were all of upper middle or upper class, and that was why they were able to have access to non-Moroccan education. So the majority of Moroccans go to Moroccan public schools and are educated um, in Arabic and in French, and not very many of them know English. So, um, so this cultural stream is really important to them, but also very limited in the scope of what of who it reaches in Morocco. <laughs> so back to this great diagram from Frederick Barth. Um, so what I found was that there's an interaction between Moroccan cultural streams and American cultural streams. And these are in quotes because they're not homogenous in any way. I mean, if I asked you guys what American culture was, I would get 50 different answers. And the same is true for what Moroccan culture is. Um, and yet, we still see these dominant traditions of knowledge, so Islam or modernity or science, um, that kind of come in and affect these people at this level and um, tend to, to conflict with each other. And when there is this contradiction in, in traditions of knowledge, the individuals are forced to kind of place their, their cultural values and concepts in a hierarchy. Um, and that inf affects what their intentions are. So if you're in a situation, if you're Moroccan and you're in a situation where you, know, you have the choice to fast for Ramadan or you know, maybe all your friends are going to get dim sum and you have to choose like, am I gonna stay back and not eat or should I go and be more assimilated? And then, so those are these different cultural streams coming into, con into contact here. You have to choose which mo is more important to you or which identity you want to put on in that situation. Um, so that's really what I found that affects uh, the experience and the strategies of, of Moroccans assimilating in, in Boston. So I think I have a couple more minutes if anyone has questions. Um, so four of the five of them were students, um, <laughs> and uh, Yassine was the only male, and he was also older. Um, he's the owner of a Moroccan restaurant, and he actually migrated here 28 years ago. Um, and he's really interesting. He has an American family. He has two kids. Um, he has, also has like a really strong Moroccan and Muslim identity. Um, actually, probably more Moroccan than the other people that I talked to. So, but most of them were students. Yeah, and Yassine migrated here for education. Um, but ended up not being able to finish his degree here. So. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, was there anything that you found or learned that was particularly surprising to you? Um, I would say, so, okay. Yes, <laughs> lots of things. Um, so I actually started doing research on Moroccan food culture, um, and I did a lot of research <laughs> um, and found that because my informants were mostly college students, they didn't really have a choice in what they ate. <laughs> um, but they did have a lot of really interesting views on Moroccan food and American food and a lot of things, even when I wasn't asking questions about food, if I would ask, you know, what was surprising to you about America, they'd be like, oh, people eat so much here or like, oh, all well, the food is so greasy. And so it was really interesting. I think that, that the Moroccan views on America are, are really interesting and also quite stereotypical. Um, and that also kind of plays into why a lot of my informants didn't have very many American friends, um, had like more international friends. As there's, I think there's this stereotype of Americans that they hold interesting. I think I'm out of time. <laughs> yeah, thank you.